Terence is here, so let's just give him all our fires. And Terence, welcome. Great to see you again here. Wonderful, wonderful to be here, and always such a gift of what you do. And my goodness, I just want to put one more plug out for uh, Cynthia, and you can put up the, the the first slide as I as I get going here. The depth of her work in terms of sense making, not just the stories of how to make people feel good or collect it to understand culture. The depth of her work um, is, is really phenomenal. And she's also worked on the technology side of how do you translate and find the patterns in those. And so some of you may also be familiar with the work of Cognitive Edge and, and David Snowden. And she had worked very closely with IBM and David Snowden. And so anyway, I just want to say that um, the importance of her work for our field. And I'm so glad that uh, that, that you had her. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, the first place to begin in this talk, I think, Artem, is, is this idea that what is grace? You know, we're, we're going to be kind of poetic and we're going to be pondering and we're really going to build upon um, of many of the things that, that Cynthia shared in her session. And when we say grace, there's this idea that there's something above and beyond that just drops on us and, and gives us uh, a gift, gives us something, something new. So a lot of the work in, in storytelling is about what we do with the individual pieces to then create something new. And I really want to get across this idea that things emerge. Cynthia talked about that translation process, you know, as the two groups, once you've collected in a respectful manner the stories, what do the groups do with those? What do you do with them? Where do they go? And how does that create something new that's unexpected? Because this whole conference is about building bridges and where we are living in this very troubling world and I, I'm going to say it wrong so please say the name of this uh, bridge that's over the Moscow River so I, I don't butcher it and insult uh, all, all of our colleagues in, in Russia. Uh, I'm guessing I'm not I'm not sure I, 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 I'm not, not a great like don't have a great knowledge of the names of architecture, but I guess there are. I know where is this? Like this is the on the Krasnopresnyanska, I guess, next to the. Uh, I don't know the. Yeah, we have we have someone more knowledgeable than me, Yana. Thank you so much, Patriarchy uh, Most. Thank you. I just didn't want to even like try to say that and and butcher it. So, so you know I, the I, name and I don't know it. You don't know the pronunciation. You don't want to say it and I didn't want to say it. <laughs> but but I'm very purposeful in selecting this bridge because as Cynthia said, stories can be used as weapons and we're really in this conference talking about stories also as bridges that create healing and possibility in organizations and even well and beyond organizations like the work of Paul Costello and others and Giannis and, um, you know, many people that who have been on uh, already in this in this conference. At the end, I also want to kind of say this. We get into this place of relativism in storytelling, which says that all stories are true and um, we all just create our truth and it just meshes into this um, really messy, messy, actually kind of chaotic place. I would ask that you entertain the idea, not so much that my story has to be true and there's an absolute truth to my story, but that somehow in the sense making, in the coming together, in a very imperfect way, we're trying to move towards something better than what are our individual stories, that we're moving towards a, a place of emerging truth that hopefully is bringing us to a healing and a place with more possibilities than where we've been on the other side of the bridge. And so, you know, obviously at the end of this, at the end of this bridge is the Cathedral of Christ the Savior. So take that as, as a representation of this idea that we're trying to get to a better place. We're trying to get to a place that we, where we reflect more of that, of that truth. Okay, let's keep going. This is lovely. I'm going to leave you at that and uh, okay. just let me know if I need you. Okay, perfect. Um, I also want to just um, honor um, Graham Williams. Um, I, I don't know if, if Artem had a, had a chance in the session with Graham, but we did lose a really wonderful story practitioner. And I, I worked um, with Graham and his, 
this this conference really reflects in many ways things that were very dear to him this idea of healing this idea that we build bridges so we just lost him a couple of uh, about a month ago um and uh i would just ask that we remember him and uh, i dedicate uh, my session uh to him okay artem let's uh cue up the the music because um in this uh session I want to use as the opening metaphor, since we're talking about bridges, a, a song by a folk group, Simon and Garfunkel, and I'm sure they have a kind of an international, uh, you'll, many of you will recognize this music, but let's listen to the first part of this song and, uh, and then we'll use it as a metaphor before we go into some very, very practical things. So I promise you we won't just be in poetry and, uh, and metaphor. We will get to some practicality, but let's start with the song. Thank you, Aram. Thank you. We can go back to the slides. So, why are we looking at this song? Let's look at this image of a, of a child with tears. And I want to suggest that at our core, all of us are quite vulnerable. All of us have at one time or another, if not even at the present time, have a sense of weariness. And in the face of major changes, of things being contentious, of things being uncertain, we feel really small. And a child really shows us that level of vulnerability. In the next couple of slides, you'll see a, a, a couple of images of, of children. And I want us to see, as Cynthia um, made clear in this idea of power and how people show up when we are in this storied sharing, how that many times our pain is is hidden. Um, and when things get rough, what is the friend that we can find? Well, we can find those memories. We can find those stories and those experiences. And perhaps, again, in taking the individual stories and moving towards a collective collection of stories that allows something new to be built allows a bridge to take us from a place without possibility to a place of feeling heard, of feeling known, of feeling safe. This is the metaphor of how stories can begin to operate. So in the song, like a bridge over troubled waters, I will lay me down. So the bridge is the, is the story. And we all live in this moving, troubled water. And this next statement is absolutely critical to the core heart that I wish to leave you with in this talk, which is, I will lay me down. What does it mean to lay down my story? If stories are part of how we build a bridge, then is there something almost sacrificial if someone's in hurt, if someone's in pain, what am I doing to bring them to a safe place? How am I laying myself down? How am I laying the vulnerabilities of my experiences, my stories, and how am I being open to the experiences and vulnerabilities of others? And in that space of shared rawness, what is possible? So we look, go on to the next part of the verse and it continues in this vein. Again, we see this child. Here's a child with almost an angry face because when we feel powerless, when we're in the midst of, of chaos, what do we do? We're like an animal, right? We, we might lash out. We lash out in organizations. We lash out in, in all different types of settings when we f don't feel heard or when we feel powerless, right? We do one of two things. We either lash out or we go deeper into our pits of, of despair. So here's this child kind of scared and beginning to almost look angry and distrustful. But what's going to comfort him? I will take your part. Or when the darkness comes and pain is all around, what's going what's gonna to help us? Well, the stories, the bridges that we can build over these troubled waters. But I'm going to have to lay me down. I'm going to have to lay me down like a bridge over troubled waters. Now we get, um, we'll stop at this, at this verse because this verse, this part of the song, sail on silver girl, sail on by. 
Your time has come to shine. All your dreams are on their way. So as we look at this image of a, of a moon and a ship sailing, and now we're over the water, what is emerging? So there's something that we can sail into through the translation, through the merging of stories that allow for a creation of a new story, a new narrative that gives us a lattice that we can then climb hopefully to a new place, a place that takes us closer and closer to a wholesomeness, to a greater, a greater truth that can be shared and that is energizing and gives all people, more people, possibilities. And this is my friend. Oh, if you need a friend, my, the stories that we will create together, that we will lay down, that's what will give us that, that place of hope. So now, um, let's think about, um, let's think about this idea of bridges. So bridges is a meeting place. This whole conference is about stories becoming the meeting place in which people bring, um, their, their, their ills, um, and want to create something new. So it's a possibility metaphor. Bridges are about possibility. And I love this on the left-hand side of the slide. When we deal with stories, and this again was very much strong in, in everything Cynthia was sharing with us, this idea of respect, right? Um, that, Brit, that stories, when I listen to the story, I am not judging. I, in fact, change the way in which I'm showing up even with my heart, mind, and spirit because I, if I am truly open to your story, then I am standing, trying to stand in your shoes. So it shifts just even the way that my whole physiognomy, the way in which I, I am engaging with myself and with the world. Um, and then Confucius talks about this idea that as we hear each other's stories, we realize that we've hurt ourselves, we've hurt others. We're just imperfect. So that's just the nature of what we're going to be dealing with when we deal with the human drama. And, and so the, the stories, the bridges as stories um, require us to consider the possibility of forgiving. Otherwise, we're going to break these bridges that we're trying to, to, to build. This is a, a Frida Kahlo, a, a painter, and I, I chose her because this, this idea of movement in story comes from a place of, of passion. It comes from this place that intentionally I say, I don't want us to be in pain in this organization. I don't want people not to be able to you know, use their gifts and their talents more effectively. I don't want there to be divisions. Now, let's be real. There are places in which people are vested in that toxicity. So I don't mean to paint a um, everything can always be perfectly rosy picture. And in fact, uh, Frida lived quite a pain to life herself. But she understood that that passion, a desire to merge, emerge from, from a place of darkness into light, to build something new, which was her creative impulse. She was a painter that that allows us to move from pain to something new with, with, with possibility. So understand that passion is a really critical part. Now, Arden knows me well and knows that this is a theme that, that is part and parcel to all the work that I do, and I'm unabashed about it. And, and that is that if we're talking about passion, um, Let's talk about it in terms of this uh, very big concept, philosophical concept, but that love. Love is at the heart of it. So if love is present in our desire for building healing and new possibilities, then that's the bridge between us and, and, and everything. It's love is the bridge that joins these worlds together. It's the one that takes those two different groups that aren't hearing one another, that see that there's divisiveness and allows those worlds to come together in a fundamentally uh, new and different way. So continuing on this, let's just say that all bridges, stall story bridges, if they can be built from love, give us the greatest chance 
and I will get specific in this in in the two examples that I that I give you. So I promise you not to just be poetic and philosophical. But all bridges that are made are are, are made from love. So if we really are about trying to cross from one place to another, then love will have to be at the center of it. And when we move to the truth beyond the mind, our minds are limited. Any one of our minds are limited, no matter how sharp they are, no matter how much they uh, have expertise and, and, and depth and experience in any, in any domain, our, li- our minds are limited. So we're trying to move to something that is, that is much greater, to a true collective intelligence, artificial, real intelligence, not artificial intelligence that, that is wonderful and offers us all kinds of new possibilities in this brave new world that we're entering, but still is only made from existing things, is only an imitation of itself. There's something that I would argue um, with the human imagination, which is part and parcel of uh, storytelling, that um, gives us an ability to extend ourselves beyond our mind and to live in our hearts and our spirit and to bring all three of those, heart, mind, soul, and spirit together in a powerful way. So love creates bridges where it would seem that things were impossible. How could we ever possibly get along? How could we ever find synergies? So this is our last kind of poetic, uh, poetic slide. And again, it goes back to the song um, like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down, I will lay me down. I really want you to kind of consider this idea that if we said that stories are bridges, stories are built from, from love, um, story bridges have love at the center of them, then what is this kind of love that we need? And again, it's right there in the song. It's this sacrificial type of love. It says that my story is not the only story. My story is not the absolute truth. I will share my story because it's a vulnerable part of a perception and an experience that I have. And it's a true experience. It's true to me. It should be true to this ecosystem that I've lived in, this organization in which I found myself in. And yet, um, love burns its brightest when it's sacrificial. So here we have pictures. There's a father, again, with a child who's suffering cancer. And what do we learn in fatherhood and motherhood and unclehood and friendshiphood about caring for others, laying ourselves down in order to help others? There's there's a therapist or maybe a, a sister or cousin with another child. Dick Hote is in the center picture. He was known for running the Boston Marathon, always with his disabled son. And And we need to know that love is relational. Stories are what help us to enter into the human experience of being relational, right? We talk about stories as connecting. Well, love at its core is relate is relational, and we are relational beings, and we're called to greater and greater levels of differentiated but integrated relational capacity through the power of, of, of stories, which is how we can, can really get at, um, at this. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to um, talking about now two interventions. Um, this first one is uh, a lot of fun. It's a dangerous, and I loved how Cynthia both closed her talk and even opened her talk about let's talk about the things that are dangerous about stories, that stories can be manipulative and whatnot. So in this exercise, you're going to roast the company. You're going to bring in a senior executive and you're going to roast. Now, roasting in English is a term that we use to characterize when you sort of in a playful way make fun of something. So often when someone leaves an organization um, that they've been there for a long time, people might have fun and say all the funny things that happened and and you playfully roast the, uh, the, the person. Let's talk about this intervention. In this intervention, you get a, a, a large group of people together and uh, from different parts of the organization representing, again, different levels within the organization and different differentiated. This is the example I'm giving. We can apply this group process in lots of different ways, but I'm going to kind of give it to you at this larger kind of scale. And uh, one of the first times I did this, I um, had in the room, everyone kind of get the group warmed up. And then in the room, I had 
a key word from all of their cultural values. So maybe there were like five cult cultural values and you could pull out five key words that were representative of the organization's um, culture. And you invite people, and again, as Cynthia says, you invite. So not everyone, ha if, if someone doesn't feel like they can do this, then you let them become what I call an ambassador and they just wander around kind of watching the other, other groups. And you have to manage, obviously, dynamics. And we're not gonna get into group process facilitation. I'll just take it that some of these things you'll understand. And um, also, I will be giving you a guide to the next group process. Uh, so our Artem will be sending out to all of you a detailed guide to the next process that I share with you. So, um, but anyway, um, people self-organize and they go to one of these values that they feel they can say something about, that they want to share something about. And in small groups, they um, take their own stickies and they um, remember a time when they experienced this value being reflected in the organization in some way, that they had an experience of, let's say the value was stewardship. So they might um, write down a story of, of a time when they had a personal experience around stewardship. Um, and so they place all of those um, on the board. And then as a small group that's huddled around that particular board, people talk about it. Now, again, if someone can't find one of those values that they feel they want to be a part of, you say, well, just why don't you just walk around and why don't you eavesdrop on the various different, different groups? And if you find one that, uh, you know, there's an interesting conversation you want to be a part of, fine. If not, come on over here. I'm over at the coffee table and, and you and I can chat. So again, giving people sort of permission, and this always does self-organize. So don't worry that everyone's just going to come over and have coffee with you. It, it, it works itself out. Um, after you finish this, you have a senior executive come in. And I will have hand selected a very junior person. So uh, when the senior executive come in, it comes around right around a break time. And you um, have a younger, powerless person um, take the senior executive around during the break and, and give them a tour of the, of the different boards where people have been putting their stories. And then you come back and you have that junior person share one or two stories and then you have some people from the group at large share a couple of the stories that they heard that really stood out for them. So again, you start in the positive, you're giving, you're giving all of this. Then comes the challenging part. You place the executive right there in the center of the room and you set some ground rules. But now stories are gonna be shared around failures in the organization. So everyone can't give an opinion what they have to do, of course, is share a story. That's the basic, that's a basic ground rule. And this person is going to receive these things on behalf of the company. The process ends, again, you, you time box this, there, there are different constraints. The process ends with then a translation of, well, then what do we do with any of these stories? And you give the executive a chance to identify a few of these stories and not be defensive, but instead suggest possible next steps that he or she feel might be possible. And when he then suggests that, you then allow for a little bit of a, a little bit of ideation. Now, obviously, when you pick this executive, you need a really good executive who's able to take some heat, who is able to think well on, on the spot, who also will be committed in following up. So it's absolutely critical if you don't have follow up and people don't see action coming out of all of this vulnerability and sharing, then you've got a problem. So where's the lay me down here? Well, the lay me down, of course, is in the individual stories that, that people feel vulnerable enough in, in sharing. And again, you start people in, in a place where they feel some positivity before getting to a place of criticality. I might suggest that you start this um, exercise maybe with something like a project after action review. So rather than kind of a big summit, which is sort of what I characterize for you, you might um, do this in a little bit more of a controlled manner. And um, projects have after action reviews where everyone looks at, hey, for the last 18 months that we've been on this journey, you know, what worked, what didn't work. 
So you could structure this type of activity um, as a way of merging with new narratives, new ideas of what really happened, healing people that may have felt ostracized, may have felt alienated, may have felt hurt in the process of a, of a program or a project, and now bring them together in a new way with new ideas about how moving forward they could perhaps do things you know differently in a, in a healthier and more productive way. Okay, let me get to the second example. This this is called Mirror, and um, I kind of stumbled upon this, and I will be giving you the a facilitator guide for this. Um, Artem Artem will share that with you. Um, I stumbled upon this, and I had been brought in by a, a company, and um, they wanted. They wanted to bring some healing to their software engineers and the customer service representatives. So uh, these were like people who were internally handling trouble tickets around technology. So they, these were customer service, internal customer service representatives that were dealing with kind of technology issues around supporting particular applications. And then the software engineers that were responsible for it. And there was a lot of finger pointing and people really weren't listening to one another. And so um, I kind of brought, found a triage of, of, some, of some issues. So went carefully through the trouble log and found some kind of juicy issues and then made sure that we were gonna hear in separate ways, by the way. So I, I kind of, when you do this exercise, you have two separate groups and each group is going to kind of be opinionated and each group in this case was really very very well embedded um, in its perspective about where the real problems were you know it's it's in the customer service representatives and their process you know it has nothing to do with the code that we write or or, or the way in which we implement and run these applications so you know finger point so you pull out uh, I pulled out um, a trouble ticket and then the group was going to listen to the stories from from each side and of course, something remarkable happened when when people got behind the defensiveness and began to kind of understand a little bit of the other perspective. Um, let me give you the second example, um, a, a, a case study where I kind of matured this process. And um, the most striking example happened to me shortly after December, uh, excuse me, September 11th, 2001. So. In, in the US when we were dealing with the terrorist attack. Um, I was in New York maybe several months after that and um, decided to take a real risk. Um, I, uh, I decided that I wanted to get people to share their different points of view on whether people should be checked in the subway. So we go through airports and you go through security to make sure that there's no gun or knife on you and. Um, there was a discussion that New York City would begin implementing security checks at, at the subway. And people had very strong opinions about this in, in both directions. And I, I was doing this as a leadership retreat, and so I kind of took it out of the organizational setting and wanted to take a very, very contentious kind of um, issue and have people deal with it. So you start the process by actually having people poll privately, anonymously, um, um, but um, have them poll on the issue. Do you believe we should do this or not? Well, you know, where do you stand on this? And so you take the poll and then you organize people. People can see, you know, you know kind of what, what, the, what the starting results are. Then you get a speaker that represents each one of those views. So I feel strongly that we should be checking people through the subways. I feel absolutely we should not do that. And you ask one or two speakers for each side. These speakers, of course, can't give an opinion. They have to share an experience that in some ways embodies this viewpoint that they have. What, what are some experiences they've had that have formed this worldview that they have that we should either be checked or, or not checked? And um, you, the speakers don't get to hear one another, so just the group gets to hear the speaker. And then you listen to the stories. And then at the end, you have the group vote again. And what you see, of course, is that there's some shift. 
that when people hear the stories, in this case, there was one person who really shared a story about how they were an immigrant into the US and they had lived in a very repressive regime. And the, um, the idea of having their, their freedom after they came to this country because of its freedoms taken away from them and, and the story of their grandfather and all of this, you know, people like were, wow, I never thought of it that way. And they felt the passion of this person as they laid down the vulnerability of what was really behind their strong feeling and opinion. And likewise, you had another set, another set of stories where, where people had really been, had really been hurt and needed something to take more safety, to take care and, you know, a control of their situation. And so the group sees that as we listen to stories, something, something happens, right? You know, we, we soften and it's in that softening that we get to that place where translation can turn, translation and merging of stories can turn into a new narrative of possibilities not thought about, not known, you know, before. And, and that's the other kind of key idea is that stories really are not about control at all. Stories are the reverse. And, and sometimes we tend to, to use stories thinking that if we get the right set of stories told or shared and people hear them, that we can control what people um, think and, and take them in, in a direction. And as Cynthia said, that's manipulation. That's the dark side of story. And we need to be very, very aware of, of you know, of that. Um, okay, I think that gives us just a, few, uh, a minute or two for, for questions, Artem. I'll, I'll kind of pause there and um, see what people might want to uh, want to ask. And while we are waiting for the questions, uh, I just want to appreciate how, um, how much you've given us in such a short time and how you've given us a, a medley of poetry and practice. Uh, I honestly, I like the picture with the marshmallows and uh, <laughs> my, we just had a ch small chat with my wife. Uh, she's an narrative practitioner and she said, uh, is this roasting about the organization getting more bore, like more boundaries on the outside and softening on the inside? I love that. <laughs> I absolutely love to, to, to her. And yes, exactly. Ex ex exactly. You know, a little charred because we do get hurt in the process, but we but we soften and we, we definitely soften. And how you put the marshmallow over the fire, you know, you don't put it all in and it just like sets off in flame, you know, and you're patient <laughs> and you're turning the marshmallow and you also want the embers. You don't want the burning fire. You want to try to find the portion of the fire that is just is just, you know, um, light em embers in order to, to kind of brown and soften the inside of the marshmallow. Thank you to, to, to your wife. You know, she opened up that metaphor because that's <laughs> all that I would hope that people would, would think about. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, guys, if you have questions for Terrence, now would be a great time and uh, to, add, to ask them. And uh, in the meantime, Terrence, um, I would like to ask you a traditional question. You've heard it before, but... Uh, if you were to choose one more meaning, like people can build bridges over borders, which meaning would you get people inspired about uh, so we can have more bridges in this world? Sacrifice. Be willing to make a sacrifice. Sacrifice uh, with your own vulnerability. Sacrifice with, with your openness. Sacrifice in that none of us stand alone, that it is, it is only in coming together with a, with a greater hope of, of love and integration and relationality in, in relationship that possibilities uh, are, are, emerge. What a great adage to the collection of meanings. Thank you so much. I like how this sacrifice doesn't sound like putting yourself in the fire but it's lighting the meaning you are ready to sacrifice for so it's not for nothing thank you so much for that absolutely absolutely oh, loved it and the singing was wonderful i second denise on that that's that's <laughs> <laughs> okay so if there are any more questions uh please write them to the chat uh, terence if i may please stay for like five ten minutes um if, if if you have the time uh to check the chat and uh we will be slowly moving forward but now 
let's appreciate Terence for what he has brought to this conference from the Patriarchy Bridge to this beautiful metaphor. And actually, our next speaker, Bruce, is also appreciating what you brought. So we will be moving to him now. Terence, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Arden. What you do, we are so grateful. So grateful for how you have been an agency of, of, of healing and bridge building. Bless you. Thank you so much.